Good morning. Y'all can sit down. Thank you so much. That's so sweet. Well, I'm so excited to be here with y'all this morning. First of all, I just want to say hey to the Cumberland campus and the Overflow Rooms. Thanks for being at church on Sunday. Um, I'm so excited. I love every time I get to do anything with passion. I love your church. Y'all love your church? Yes? It's awesome. I love it because every time I come here, it's so awesome. I get all these texts from people who go to passion that say, we're so excited you're going to be at our house. And I love how y'all say our house because it just makes me feel like I belong. It makes me feel like a family. And that's how y'all treat people. That's how your leaders treat people. I just want to say thank you to Louie and Shelly for just how you lead, how you serve uh, people and love people so well. Can everybody thank the pastors and the team? All of you guys, the worship leaders. This church is just amazing. Everybody who serves, who opens the door, you make everybody feel so excited, not just about church, but about Jesus. And that's really awesome. You know, uh, Shelly kind of mentioned that she has really believed in me and she's really kind of let me have a voice. The first place I ever gave a message was at Passion. I was so nervous and I'm still nervous, but I'm very thankful for how they keep letting me use my voice because I feel like in doing that, y'all aren't just saying, oh, we believe in you, Sadie. You're saying you believe in the younger generation. And I feel like that's touching a lot of other people who are my age and younger than just me. I know that's true. So thank you for how y'all lead and how y'all love. Um, I'm so excited. I'm pumped. I'm gonna read the scripture today then we'll jump into prayer and dive into the message. Um, but my passage that I'm going off of today is from Matthew 14. It's a very common one. Y'all probably know it, but I know that the word is active and alive. And I know that this is gonna speak to y'all. And so let's read when Peter walked on water. All right, it says in verse 22, immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. So the crowd that Jesus was dismissing is what just happened. He just fed the 5,000. So just to so have a little context, miracles are happening. It's a really cool, exciting time and they are on the move. So Jesus is like, disciples, Go ahead, get on the boat. I'm going to dismiss the crowds. And it says, After he dismissed the crowd, he went up on the mountain to pray to himself. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against him. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. But the disciples saw him walking on the sea. They were terrified and said, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered them, him saying, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on water. Uh, he got out of the boat and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink. And he cried, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand, took hold of him saying to him, oh, you of little faith, why do you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshiped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. All right, let's pray before we dive in. God, I just thank you so much for this word. God, I thank you um, for who you are, what you're doing, what you're always doing. God, I pray that today we would just be so in tune with your spirit, God. Lord, I pray that your spirit would anoint me to speak this word to your people. God, I pray that every single person would receive something from your word today, God. I pray that it would awaken them. I pray that it would give them more passion and more desire to know you. And God, I pray that you be with my words to articulate what you're trying to say. Lord, we love you so much. We have so much confidence in who you are. It's in your name we pray, amen, amen. All right, how many people are still excited that we're in 2020, right? You better be, because it's only February. But 2020, there's been like so much excitement behind 2020, and y'all's church has been in an amazing series. I'm like Passion Church Online. I watch on YouTube every Monday when it gets uploaded. I get so excited because I love this church. I love the sermon series y'all are in about the roaring 20s and about the roar from the tribe of Judah. I love it. But most people, whenever they hear 2020, like your pastor had this amazing word. It's so good. But most people, when you're like 2020, it's like it's the year of vision, baby, because it's 2020, right? Anybody like feel like we're going 2020, clear eyes, full heart, can't lose? Like that's exactly what I thought of when I thought of 2020. And that was how my husband felt too. My husband was so excited because this guy loves him some vision. Let me tell you. The first time, I'm not even kidding, our first phone call, okay? Like, we're just like, he just gave me his number, just was going to call me. We're getting to know each other, asking all those random questions that you ask somebody. They go a little deep, they're kind of shallow sometimes. It was like, how do you like your coffee? 
when did you know Jesus? What's your Enneagram number? And I'm not kidding. He was like, do you have 2020 vision? It's literally what he asked me. Like, I'm not kidding. And I was like, yeah, uh, I actually do have 2020 vision, kind of random. And he was like, oh, that's really cool. I actually had 2015. And I was like, so you're that guy. Well, I don't know if this is gonna work. But hey, to break it to you, Christian's year of vision was 2015. But now we're in 2020 and it's a new year of vision. It was really funny because we were in the Chick-fil-A drive through and we were talking about our word for the year. And I don't know how much more Christian millennial you can get in the Chick-fil-A drive through talking about our word for the year. And so I look over at him and I'm like, babe, you know, 2020 is around the corner. We gotta get a word for the year because last year our word's just, you know, so challenging, so powerful, you know. And he's like, yeah, I know. Oh, I'm really excited about this one. I'm really excited. And to nobody's surprise, he's like, going with vision. It's 2020, baby. And I'm like, okay, yeah, like no shock. And if any of you know my dad or have seen my dad on TV or even know the Enneagram, he's an eight on the Enneagram. My dad is a challenger. And my dad like challenges everything that we say. He's like, do you really believe that? Are you really confident in that? So some of that kind of bleeds through me sometimes because I'm kind of like my dad. So I was like really trying to let my husband, you know, just pick his word and let him be his word and, you know, support the vision. But I'm sitting there and I'm just like, ah, oh, I gotta say something. I just gotta give a little pushback. So I was like, Okay, vision's great, I love it. I'm, I'm, I actually hope, you know, for vision too, but, but let me just ask you, like, does that word really challenge you? Like, do you really feel like we need more vision? Because you've been telling me so much vision that you have. You've been telling me all about this vision that God's given you. We've been talking about the vision we have together. And so do you really feel like in 2020, you need more vision? And Christian was like, okay, you're right. Let me think about it a little bit longer. So that we, another week goes by and now we're at Passion. So again, Christian Millennial, Ayo, who was at Passion this year, 2020? It was the best place to be in the new year. And we're sitting there and he looks over, he's like, babe, I got my word. I'm like, what is it? He's like, it's faith. He said, because what I realize is you're right. We have a lot of vision. And now I think what we really need is faith for the vision. And when he said that, I was like, now that's a word. I love that, faith for the vision. When I look at this passage, it's really interesting to me because I was just reading it two weeks ago and I just realized something. What started out as a vision problem actually ended up becoming a faith problem. What started out as something they couldn't recognize, they thought Jesus was a ghost because they couldn't really see. It was the nighttime, it was when. That's not what Jesus challenged them with. He's like, you have little faith. What was once the vision issue is now really a faith issue. You see, because here's the thing, we can come into 2020 and it would be amazing to have vision. I love vision. The Bible talks about where there's no prophetic vision, people wander astray. Like we, like, yes, we want to have vision, but at the same time, we could have so much vision, but if we don't have faith, nothing happens. If we don't have obedience, nothing comes of it. We could have more vision than you had in 2019, but still the same outcome if you don't start walking. We gotta walk into that vision. We gotta get out of the boat. You see, vision, when we think about 2020, we get excited because we know 2020 has to do with eyesight. But eyesight and vision are kind of different things. Eyesight in 2020, and what that's kind of referencing is that the human can see, it's like really just the average human can see. So if it's a 20 feet away distance, we can see it as if it's 20 feet away. It doesn't mean we have perfect vision. It means we can see it like the average human can see it. And I think that's really important to know, and it kind of is good to know that even Mr. 2015 over here, none of us have perfect vision. None of us have perfect eyesight. And it's important to know because that means all of us are gonna have to have a little faith. When I think about that and I started looking up the definition of vision, there was a definition that I thought was really, really powerful. It says it's a mental image of what the future will be or could be. And I love that, will be or, or could be. I think that's an important phrase right there, it could be that. Yes, God's giving you this amazing vision and it could be that, but you're gonna have to have faith for it to be that. You're gonna have to have obedience and discipline and you have to wake up and have confidence in who he is and what he's gonna do for that to happen. It's what could be. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 2, 5, that we walk by faith and not by sight. And I think that's so, so powerful that we get to walk by faith and not by sight. Now that doesn't mean it's not scary, but that means we have to have dependency on God. And I think about that moment with all of them in the boat. 
And what really got me and convicted me as I was reading this again just last week, I was thinking, man, all of them in that boat saw the same thing. Like Peter, along with the other disciples, it was nighttime for all of them. It was windy for all of them. The waves are big for all of them. But one of them walked on water that night. One of them decided to get out of the boat, but all of them had the same opportunity. You see, in 2020, we could all be really excited about vision. We could all be in the same house and all be hearing the same words and have the same vision, but yet some of us walk on water. Some of us walk out this door and actually do something with it because some of us believe that that might be God. That might be Jesus. Hmm, looks a little crazy, seems a little crazy, but something is different. Why was it different for Peter that night? I think it has to do with the conversation Peter and Jesus had right after Jesus said, don't be afraid. Listen to what Peter said. He said, and Peter answered him saying, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. I thought that was such a cool thing that Peter asked of Jesus. Because I think about some of the things I asked Jesus, like had that been me in that moment in that boat, seeing like kind of something blurry out there, wondering maybe it's Jesus. I feel like what I would have said is, hey Jesus, come a little closer so I can see that it's you. Walk a little closer to the boat. Make it shine a little bit, let me, let me just see that it's you, God. Because if I see that it's you and I know that it's you, then I'll walk out to you because I know you can do stuff like that. If I see that it's you, then I'll walk out to you. Peter didn't say that. Peter didn't say, walk a little closer. Let me see that it's you before so I can make sure. He said, God, if it is you, command me to come. Yes, it's dark. Yes, it's windy. Yes, it doesn't make sense. But if I hear your voice, I'm gonna come. You're inviting me into a moment with you and I don't wanna miss it. When I was thinking about this theme that y'all have going with the roar, it's so powerful. And so, you know, I don't know much about lions, so I Googled lion facts because you just never know when you're, gonna, when you're gonna catch a revelation from Google lion facts. And so I wanted to just Google, it's like 100 facts about lions. And I'm like, this is a really cool animal, you know? And then something sticks out to me really, really cool. It said, why the lion roars? And I was just like so blown away. Because in the middle of thinking about this, this whole idea that, Peter just simply asked for a command and he heard his voice and without seeing anything, he came to Jesus. And I'm looking at this lion fact about why lions roar. And lions, it says that they roar to let other lions know where they are. And they're most active at night to let other lions know where they are without any light around. It also talks about how they roar to let others know where they are and to protect their home territory. You see, we have to know that we're not always going to see it clearly, but when we hear it clearly, we're gonna have to follow that roar because we know we're gonna be protected by our king. We know we're gonna be protected because that roar is so much greater than the roar of the wind. That roar is so much louder than the voices around us. That roar, not only is that the thing that we're gonna follow, but that's the thing that's gonna protect us. That's the thing that's calling us home. We gotta pay attention to that roar, even when we can't see it clearly. The word says in Psalms 19, 105, it says, your word is a lamp unto my feet. Psalms 19 says, your commandment is enlightening to my eye. And I say that to say, because I think sometimes we really need to trust that his word is our vision in times that we cannot see it clearly. His word is our vision. And you might be saying, well, Sadie, I don't, I don't have good vision. I don't have much inspiration right now. And I also don't really have a word. And I'm not talking right now about like an individual specific word. Although that is such a blessing when we're able to receive that from people around us. And when the Lord speaks those things, I'm not talking about that word being your vision. I'm talking about this word being your vision. This word is a lamp unto your feet. It's a light unto your path. These commandments are enlightening to the eye. And every single person, just like every single person in that boat, has the same opportunity to read the same words, but the difference is gonna be for the people who believe these words and take him at his word and walk out of the boat and trust him on the water. This is the word. And we all have this word. You know, I was thinking about, as I was coming up here and I was, I was reading on the way here, I thought about this one other part that's really, really interesting. It says, but when he saw the wind, 
he was afraid and began to sink and cry out. And I relate to that part so much because it was actually the moment that he really got the vision, that it was actually really clear what was happening, that he freaked out. How many of you can relate to that? You were like praying for vision and then you got vision and then you started to see, wait, is this what you're about to do, God? Oh, wow, that is way bigger than who I am. Like that happens to me all the time. I'm like, yes, I have faith, I'm walking into it. Oh, that's a really big room, oh shoot. But then I'm like, oh no, I got faith, I'm walking back into it. Like sometimes when we see it, clearly that's the time that we freak out. Because even when we see it, we can't fully comprehend it. Because what we really have to know whenever we're walking into something with God is that even though we might can see a little bit, His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His, like just as the heavens are higher and He's gonna do exceedingly and abundantly more than we could ever dream of. He's so much bigger. So we might actually see the moment, but we can't comprehend the moment because it's something only He can do in the moment. I was thinking about this and how like sometimes I can see something very clearly, but I can't really comprehend it. And I was kind of thinking that's like the story of my life. You know, I actually, um, I've never shared this with people publicly, but I was on my way here yesterday. And as I'm reading this, and I was starting to think like, I'm gonna have to use my notes up here because I just got asked to speak here two weeks ago. And normally whenever I speak places, I, I get asked far in advance to so have plenty of time to prepare and to prep. And my preparation looks a little bit different than some people um, because I found out years ago that I was dyslexic. And that's why it was really hard for me to read words because it makes me all confused and stuff. Because my mom would say, why don't you bring notes up there? I'd be like, I'm so confused by them. I look and I just can't read it. And which is how I started to find out that I was uh, dyslexic. Anybody else dyslexic? Okay, lots of hands, good company. Um, everybody's dyslexia is different, you know? For me, the formation of words just start to form together. And so it can make it kind of difficult to sound things out and to prepare with notes. So a lot of times, I'll just start to memorize what I'm gonna say, how I prep as I sit and I ask the Lord what to speak on. I feel like I get a word, I write it in my own way, then I repeat it by speaking it out on voice memo. And then I listen to the voice memo and I just ask God to speak through me on it. And then days before leading up to the moment that I'll speak, I'll stop listening and say, God, fill in the gap. I remember the word you gave me. Give me new words. May your spirit flow through me. Then I speak. And this time, because it was just two weeks ago and I felt so specific on this word, I was like, I'm gonna have to use my notes. And yesterday I started thinking about this, this journey of, of dyslexia. And I remember whenever I was little, I thought that I must have like an eyesight problem. Like the teacher had just told my mom that I was like really behind in school and that my reading was below average and the rest of the kids. And so I was like, well, there's got to be a problem here. It's probably my eyes. I probably just need glasses. So I told my mom to take me to the eye doctor. Well, I get there and I was so confused because I could actually see all the letters clearly in that 2020 test. I could see the E and I could see all the different letters and I was getting so frustrated because I wanted the doctor to know I had a problem. So I'm not gonna lie. I lied to the doctor. I was like, the E kind of looks like an F. Like, cause I wanted him to know like there's something wrong here, but I, I can't see it. So they gave me glasses. Well, clearly that didn't help cause that wasn't the problem. And it was always interesting to me until years later, it, we kind of joke in my family that the only test I made a hundred on was the dyslexia test because that was when I was like, I know, so I knew something was wrong. But the problem is, and why, <laughs> why it was so confusing is because I could see it clearly, I just couldn't comprehend it very well. And then I found out that dyslexia, it's not an eyesight problem. It's not a vision problem. It's the way that my brain forms and processes the words. So how did I go through school? How do I learn these things? How, do I, how am I able to read the Bible? Well, I just learned how to remember the sound of the word. Even though I might write it different, like for instance, even in my notes, I was saying what the future held and I spelled what the W-H-A-T-H-E. It was a formation of both of those words. But I know that that sounds like what the. So I start to learn how the word sounds. I start to remember the, the formation of the word, the way that it's supposed to be. I don't trust in the dyslexia. I trust in my knowledge of the word. And see, that's the thing that we have to see with God. Sometimes we're gonna see it clearly. We can't comprehend it very well, but we remember from the knowledge of the word what he must be doing. I have to trust that he's doing. We see it clearly. We can't comprehend it but we know the character of who he is and we know the faithfulness of the word. There were so many people in the Bible that saw it very clear, but couldn't comprehend it 
but trusted him at his word. Think about Noah. Noah didn't see a thing, but started building an ark. Joshua saw a ginormous wall, but walked around it seven times. Sarah, Abraham saw old age, but stepped out of their tent. Moses saw an inadequate man who had a problem with speaking, yet he heard his name called by a burning bush and after a little conversation, went back. Peter, he saw the absolute impossible, but he heard an invitation and so he walked on the water. They didn't see it clearly. They couldn't possibly comprehend it all the time, but they obeyed his word because they recognized his voice. But here's the thing, you have to start to learn his voice. If you wanna follow the direction of this word, you have to start to trust this word and in trusting that you have to have confidence in it and to have confidence in it, you really have to know it and be in relationship with it. I'm gonna end with this. Um, It's a Mother Teresa quote and I think it's so, so, so cool because she's so sweet, but this moment is so savage. This person came up to her And he asked her a question. He said, Mother Teresa, can you pray for me? She said, yes, I can pray for you. And then he said, can you pray that I have clarity? And Mother Teresa said, no, I will not pray that you have clarity. Like, and I I always like, when I read that part, it shocks me so much because like people have asked me to pray some like, for some random things, honestly. Somebody asked me the other day to pray that their laptop would come on. And y'all, I literally prayed for them because I was like, all right, Lord, just be with this person. I don't know what else to pray, be with her. Because somebody asked to pray, I just say, yes, I will offer this prayer. But Mother Teresa literally told this guy, no, I won't pray for you for clarity. She said, because clarity is the last thing that you're holding on to. She said, I've never had clarity, but I have trust. And so what I will pray for you is that you have trust. And I think that that is so powerful because I think a lot of times we're just waiting on that last clarity. If you'll just come a little closer to the boat, If I could just see it a little more clearly, maybe in an hour the sun will come up. But what if right now he says, come? What if right now he says, walk out here, join me? Well then beyond the clarity, beyond the vision, even though I hope we all have vision in 2020, I hope that we have sight, I hope we have all those things. I'm gonna trust you at your word and I'm just gonna start walking. Today, on this Super Bowl Sunday, I'm gonna walk out of this building and I'm gonna start trusting you at your word before I have the full picture of what it's gonna look like. If I had waited on the full picture, I, I don't even know if I would have started walking. I feel like the Lord called me into something way before I thought I was ready, way before I was ready. But that's how it built my trust and my confidence that only He can do these things. And when I walk with Him, the miraculous things happen when it's something I can't comprehend, when I can't see it clearly, when I can't understand, but I just say, I heard your roar and I can trust that roar. 